Major League Baseball returns its peach, the All-Star Game, now relocated to Denver. We talk about it coming up. A moment in time that could potentially be monetized. Jalen Suggs of Gonzaga hit a miracle buzzer beater during the men's Final Four. How much is that shot worth? And NCAA President Mark Emmert is currently fighting to maintain his position. Should he stay? Should he go? We talk about that and more right here on 4th and Just Us. Welcome to Fourth and Just Us, our very first show, and we are so excited that you have decided to join us, and we are excited to bring you the conversations where we intersect race, politics, and sports. Kevin A.D. Anderson, Leonard Doc Moore, and I'm one of the hosts, Larisha Harris, and we want to let you know who we are so that you can understand the various perspectives that you're going to see every time you watch us every week. So before we get into the introductions, want to remind you to head over to Facebook, hit that like button. If you're on YouTube, make sure you subscribe. And also remember that during the show, we are going to take comments. So if you have any questions or comments, make sure that you drop them in the comment section where you are currently watching us right now. So let the people know who you are. Kevin A.D. Anderson. Thanks, Larissa. I am the original A.D. in Los Angeles right now. So Anthony Davis came in after me. Uh, I graduated from San Francisco State University, played football and basketball there. But over the last 30 years, I've been so fortunate to be in the lives of thousands and thousands of young people. I've been able to see them graduate, grow, and win national and conference championships. I worked at Stanford, Cal, Oregon State, West Point, Maryland, and CSUN. Glad to be with you all tonight. So you see that we're going to have the perspective of a former collegiate administrator, but we also have another perspective to share with you. Doc, let the people know who you are. Thank you, Marisha. They told me I was on a delay. So if it seems like the old school Kung Fu movies, just bear with us through the tech issues. But anyway, Leonard Moore, I'm a product of Cleveland, Ohio, and Jackson State University, VI I love. Um, I've been a professor for 24 years. I spent nine years at LSU, and uh, this is my 14th, going on my 15th year here at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, and I think I probably taught more black division one high profile student athletes than anybody else in the country. Uh, I'm the founder and director of the black student athlete summit, the dopest three day event of its kind. You will find uh, we'll be in Houston in January and uh, we're just glad to kick this thing off tonight. So you have the perspective of a former administrator on the collegiate level. You have the perspective of a professor. Then you have me, my perspective. I am a journalist, a sports reporter. I've done work for ESPN ACC network. You name it, I probably did it. And I'm honored to be here and to uh, help lead the conversations that we're going to have. So for every show, we're going to start off with the kickoff where we talk about current events. And we know that the MLB, again, returned its speech. They relocated their all-star game to Denver. The move is coming from the controversial voting law that was passed in Georgia. Now, this is a 98-page voting law that makes absentee voting harder. And it also brings about more voter restrictions and complications. So a few significant um, changes to the voting in the state of Georgia I want you all to know about so that you can understand the perspectives that you're going to hear is the new law will curtail ballot access for voters in booming urban and suburban counties, which is home to many Democrats. Voters will now have less time to request absentee ballots. But one of the most important or key parts is that it's a crime to offer water to voters in waiting lines. So. A.D., we can start with you. Do you applaud the move or the stance of the MLB? Their stance is they oppose this law, hence the moving or taking away from the uh, All-Star game in Atlanta. First of all, Richard, come on. If you're going to give somebody a bottle of water in line and they're talking about arresting you, well, I'm surprised that the uh, Major League Baseball decided to move it out of Atlanta. I mean, these are a lot of conservative people with uh, – uh, abundance of wealth. But I'll just sum it up this way. When Mitch McConnell yesterday told them to keep out of po politics and their business or his business, that says it all. 
I think for me, Larisha, I think we need to understand that, you know, you know, we were disenfranchised as black folk for about 80 years, 70 to 80 years, depending on what state you're in. And if you go back and you look at the legislation those Southern state politicians wrote in the 1880s to disenfranchise us, it had one thing in common, our no, grandfather clause, residency requirements, poll tax, literacy tests, and if none of that didn't work, violence and intimidation. But the one thing that's interesting between both sets of laws then and now is that the laws were written without any mention of race, but they were written with a specific racial impact. And so understand, you won't see anything explicit about race in the law, but again, they understood the impact uh, because in many ways, it seems that they want to suppress the vote uh, in response to Warnock and the, uh, and the white brother uh, winning the Senate election in Georgia uh, back in January. So from my perspective, I just think this this new voter law is completely ridiculous. And I saw on Instagram earlier, someone posted a quote where it said, this isn't about voter fraud. It's about historic black voter turnout. And I want you all to keep in mind uh, that I saw an official on, well, from the Cobb Travel and Tourism in Georgia, they told CNN that because of this move, the Atlanta area or the state of Georgia could suffer an economic loss of over $100 million due to this relocation. So um, again, we stand with the MLB for their stance against this voter suppression law. Moving on here, a moment in time that could potentially be monetized. Jalen Suggs of Gonzaga hit a miracle buzzer reader during the men's final four. Now, this particular shot could change the collegiate landscape. So, Doc, from your perspective, how much is this shot worth or a moment like this worth? You know, uh, Larissa, for the last 14 years, I've been to the University of Texas, and I think the most, the best college football player ever, in my opinion, is Vince Young. And and they that, that fourth and five play they show all the time, uh, the 2006 Rose Bowl, that, I would argue, is one of the most famous highlights ever. But the question is, who owns those highlights? And the sub shot, you know, who owns it? Is it, is it Gonzaga? Is it NCAA? Is it CBS? Or is it Suds? And so I, I want to bring our attention to something called an NFT. It's called a non-fungible token, right? And basically, digital art is going through the roof. There was a digital painting that sold for $69 million. And just yesterday, Tom Brady, a law company in partnership with a company called Autograph, to basically get into what they call non-fungible tokens. So think about digital collectibles. And when you talk about, you know, how much that shot could be worth, that could be worth millions upon millions of dollars. Well, with the NCAA, basically on the cups of an era where athletes can begin to um, allow to be profit or gain profit rather from their name, image, and likeness. I mean, how can the next buzzer beater potentially be uh, monetized? AD? First of all, did he call bank? Because we didn't call <laughs> bank. UCLA won the game. Uh, you know, <laughs> what's troublesome about all of this is, is that you have the federal government involved, you have state governments involved, and every state, and I think that you're looking at over 30 states that have developed legislation about this, and they're all different. So now, how do you monitor this activity? The concern with the NCAA is, is not that it's the right thing to do. I think they're more concerned about the possibilities of people uh, cheating and taking advantage of this. And that's always been the case when we look at all those rules, because, I mean, if you look at the NCAA rule book, I mean, it, it, it's unbelievable. It, it's, it, it's bigger than the Bible. So, you know, um, I think that they have to come to some kind of finding on how you move to this, but now you have the Supreme Court involved in this, and Justice Thomas said this the other day, like him or not, he questioned that how much are the athletes getting and why are they still amateurs when the coaches are making millions and millions of dollars? So are they amateurs as well, or what, what category do they fall in, and is there fairness in all this? So one thing that I think that needs to happen that hasn't happened, and as we move forward, and the NCAA does, not only with NIL, but all of this, that there has to be a vision, and there has to be some thought about how and what sports is going to look like moving forward, and be in front of it and not behind it. 
You, you know what, Kevin, this is interesting. You know, you have the you have the you know the conflating of the amateur versus the professional. And understand, listeners, amateur, you can am, there is no definition to the word amateur. The NCAA came up with the definition, but there is no definition for the word amateur. And so basically you've had a for-profit enterprise, you know what I mean, with 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 with, with nonprofit labor. And so it's just very interesting to see how this thing is gonna get separated apart. Um, one thing I notice about big time college athletics, it is immune to economic downturns. It is immune to business cycles. It is immune to everything. And understand that, you know, I think people are going to fight tooth and nail to keep the system as it is. Um, about seven, eight years ago, when they when that tobacco litigation was big, I was a, a expert witness uh, for about five years. And I remember being in the room, Kevin and Larisha, with some of these tobacco attorneys, some of these tobacco executives. And I'm like, you all can't win this. But they were, it seemed like they were destined to go down with the ship. And I'm like, y'all can't win. Public opinion has turned against you. The science is against you. But in many ways, they were willing to stick their heels in the ground and be like, hey, we're going to fight to the death of this. And it seems like that's what the NCAA is planning to do as well. Well, speaking of the NCAA, their president, Mark Emmert, is fighting to maintain his position. This all coming after he came under fire for the blatant disparities between the men and the women's basketball tournament. Now, the criticism is solely surrounding, well, I won't say solely, but it's surrounding his reaction or lack thereof to that issue. Many athletic directors and various commissioners have come out criticizing or stating their disappointment in his leadership. So the question, A.D., should he stay or should he go? First of all, it, it bothers me that people speak anonymously. Um, you know, if there's a question about his leadership or anybody's leadership, I mean, you, sh you, you shouldn't make your name known and you should question this. And there's all kind of forums that you can question it. And so when I started to read about all this, people were saying, well, you know, it's a membership organization and, you know, we don't know who really is in charge of it. And, you know, that, well, I won't use the word that I want to because I'm trying to be a better Christian. But, you know, <clears throat> that that's not true. And if you're a member of an organization um, and, and you're paying to be a member of an organization and if you don't voice your opinion and you don't talk about what you think matter, it's shame on you. Uh, you know, the other thing in in doing my research for the show today, um, it was shared with me that the women's committee knew that they were going to have this room for a stretching room with, with the equipment on it. And they voted not to have a weight room until the sweet 16. So that's not on the leader, although he should have people in there that know better than this. But, you know, I mean, the committee voted on this from what I understand. Now, I wasn't in that room, so I can't tell you yay or nay, but you know, other people have to take responsibility for this. But you know, there's one thing that you asked me in the very beginning, and um, I think Mark has been there for seven, Eleven. eight years, maybe longer. Eleven, Eleven years. Eleven. Well, as Dr. King said, longevity, everybody likes or wishes for longevity. I, I think that, you know, he said no uh, a great deal of time or said no when he had to on some cases. And now it's probably time for him to think about, you know, what's my legacy and how do I leave this in a better spot? But, Kevin, what power does Mark Emmert have? The Mark Emmert I know at LSU when I was a professor there was a performer. Uh, remember 2012, the Penn State scandal, he brought the hammer down on Penn State. $60 million fine, vacated wins for 14 years a significant loss of scholarships, bowl, postseason bowl bans, but he got crucified for it and he had to backtrack. So in his mind, if I can't, in many ways, if I can't punish Penn State for, for having boys sexually assaulted on campus in the football locker room by, by an assistant coach, then what power do I have? Kevin, let me ask you this. When you were athletic director of Maryland, you got you got athletic director, you got a university president, you got conference commissioner, you got the NCA office, then you got board of directors. What what is the chain of command in many ways in college athletics? Who really is in charge? Because I'll say this: Sean Miller got fired today by Arizona, but not because of the scandal, probably because he wasn't winning. Will Wade is still working at LSU. Bill Self is still working at Kansas, and so it seems to me we want to blame Emmert for a lot of stuff that's going on 
in many ways at the campus level. So Kevin, explain to us just the hierarchy and the structure and how decisions get made. So doc, it's a great question. And, and here's my attempt to answer this. It depends where you work. It depends on how strong the leadership is because I've worked at places where there's been board of regents and trustees that are far more involved and far more influential. I mean, I, I used to work at a, at a school where one of the highest uh, people in the state legislator would call me and tell me that he's on eight or nine of the sites. He would tell me who we were recruiting. He wanted to tell me who to, to hire and everything else. It wasn't the president, it was him. So, you know, I mean, the circumstances are different anywhere you go to, but I mean, this, there's so much money and people love to be around athletics and think that they have this power that um, it, it just depends. And let me say this, let me say this about Mark and, 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 and it's not in the defense of someone's leadership, but you know, he got four black vice presidents up there. You know, and these, I like to say, Kevin, these are real black people, Larissa, cool folk, Donald Remy, general counsel, you got Stan Wilcock, executive vice president. You got Derek Gregg, VP of diversity and inclusion. And you got Felicia Martin, who's over, I believe, the clearinghouse. And so when I look at that, you know, because we as black folk, you know, we will count. We want to see how many black folk you got in leadership and are they in significant positions. And I don't think you can question Mark's record on that. Well, Leonard, here's what I'll share with you as well. So the... African-American athletic directors have all come together. So there's probably about 30, 40 in a room, and they, I believe they meet once a week. So Mark was at a meeting with them, and so at the end of the meeting, somebody asked him, so how can we make things better? And how can we do things better? And so Mark looked at them and told them that they needed to stop paying these coaches so much money, and they need to stop building these buildings. Well, I've never seen an athletic director make a decision that I'm going to pay this person this kind of money or I'm going to build this building. I mean, Mark's got to go to his colleagues and the other presidents. And if anybody's going to put a stop to it, they should. But again, the genie's out of the bottle because the money's so great. But he, all we have to do is go back and do the Ivy League model where there's a certain amount of money you spend on athletics and, and the school's going to give it to you. And then you don't spend anything else. You go back and give. ABC and CBS and all those other folks back their money and just do it as purely amateurism and have everybody play for the love of the game. Those days long gone, brother. Tell me about it. Well, <laughs> okay. Well guys, we, we got to move on here. We can finish up that conversation another time, especially in the fourth down part where we talk about solutions and dive a little deeper uh, before we close out. But we want to talk about the NCAA women's basketball tournament. They delivered on multiple fronts, giving us nail-biting performances, games all the way down to the end, to the final seconds. But another notable note is the uptick in viewership. That's a milestone. According to ESPN, the women's championship game on Sunday averaged 4 million viewers and is the most watched women's title game since 2014. As quickly as possible, because we do want to bring in our guest. She's been patiently waiting. We have a special guest, a great guest for you all. And she can also dive in and talk about this as well. But guys, just want to know from your perspective, um, what were your thoughts on the women's tournament? Doc, we can start with you. I mean, it was awesome. You know, I have a, a daughter who plays at Incarnate Word in San Antonio. They compete in the Southland Conference. And I think like a lot of people, I think a lot of dads, we probably didn't really get into girls basketball and women's basketball until our daughter started playing. But I, I think, you know, me and my family, we probably watched 10, 11 tournament games from start to finish. I remember being in the car with my wife and it's like, you know, if the black coaches were coaching, we were watching, definitely. We were running home from the grocery store and stuff like that. But it, it was exciting. It was really, really exciting to see those sisters play. Uh, you know, it's funny, Larissa, every year um, in my class, I give my students, we, we, do a little, uh, we do a little case study and say, what would you do to make the women's game popular? And they'll say foolish is like lower the rim, shorten the court, things of that nature. But I think in many ways what, what this tournament showed is that the sisters can ball, they compete at a high level, and they can pr provide entertainment from tip off to the final whistle. AD? So one of the things that – and our special guests, I won't – Don Staley, we were on a committee together, 
And so one of the things we talked to ESPN, how can we drive viewership more? And one of the recommendations was play Friday and Sunday, not Sunday and Tuesday. And I think part of driving the viewership to where it was is because of Friday and Sunday. But I'm going to take it a step further. The basketball was just as exciting, if not as a, more exciting than the men. It was really competitive. And that, you know, what happened was that the stories behind these beautiful young women were, you know, <clears throat> were ones that you just wanted to stay and watch and, and learn more about them. So, you know, I, I think all those things happen. And that the question is now is that right now the money isn't going to be equal. The women are not going to generate the money that the men are. But what has to happen is, is that we have to take this in account and we have to have equality and that we have to say that we're going to put as much in the women's basketball game as the men's basketball game and live with it. But I, you know I think the I'm, challenge, I'm Kevin, is... Start, you, no, sorry, I'm Richard. glad you started that conversation, A.D., because we have a special guest who definitely can add on and talk about that. We want to bring it to our realm right now. Don Staley, the legendary uh, head women's basketball coach at South Carolina. She's been there since 2018 and led the Gamecocks to a 2017 national championship. But not only that, she's a three-time gold medalist and she will coach Team USA in the Tokyo Games this summer. Welcome everyone, Don Staley. Thanks for joining us. Having slight technical difficulties, but um, we can see you, Coach, and we thank you for, again, joining us. Um, I know they jumped right into it, talking about the women's game and everything. But before we we go in that particular direction, I just want to congratulate you for a job well done, uh, where you made it to uh, in the women's tournament this year. How do you feel about it? Um, I mean, I feel great about where we are as a, as a sport. Um, I think mm -hmm. a lot of times... Um, a lot of times we aren't appreciated by, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say, um, the, the people who are really enthused about sports and not, not just basketball or women's basketball. It is, you know, those people who have never watched a game, because if you've never watched a game and you just, you just want to comment on things on social media, just for the sake of it. You, you really don't understand what's happening out there on the floor. Um, we don't always play above the rim, but although some players can play above the rim, but everything below the rim is pretty similar. You know, I, I got a player on my team that, you know, can, can snatch that ball back and pull up. I got a player on my team that, you know, that can shoot deep threes. I got a player that's, you know, pretty shifty and getting to the basket. Um, when you've been around the game, at all levels. And I, I can say I've, I've played it at a high level. I coach at a high level. I've been around it as an assistant coach on Olympic teams. And I see, and I, I've been around dream teams and um, I watched, I grew up on the NBA. So I really have an understanding of um, how the game is, is played and the players that are, that are actually playing the game. Um, and there are a lot more similarities than not. Um, so we're in a great place. I mean, the viewership is up. Um, you get two black, um, female coaches in the final four on the women's side that has never been done. So representation matters. I, I just feel like when given the opportunity, when given a fair opportunity, um, we put a product on the floor that, that everybody could be proud of. And that's all we want is, um, to give a fair shake. Just watch us. Just, just watching an entire game. Um, and in a lot of ways, um, our, our final four was a, a lot more exciting. And I don't, I don't really want to compare the men because it's not about that. We're all in, under the same umbrella. We're trying to do the same thing, and that is entertain. And I just feel like um, that's what you get when you watch, especially when you watch both tournaments. Well, Coach, let me ask you this. How, how can we carry take the momentum from the NCAA tournament into the professional game? You know, I've had several students, Ariel Atkins, taught Simone Augustus at LSU, 
And, you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that they have to go overseas and play during the winter. And then, you know, here we play women's basketball in the summer. What, what can be done to, to make sure – what do we need to do to keep those sisters here in the States and, and get the WNBA uh, in, the, in, the, in the typical winter basketball season? Part, part of it is what happened um, last season with the collective bargaining agreement where the top players are making enough money to stay here and not go overseas. But now the money's so good over there that um, it, it it triples. Some of them some of them get paid triple what they would get. And I do believe that the highest salary in the WNBA is, is, is over $200,000 um, at this time. And $200,000, you, you can live off, but... If you're somebody like Brittany Griner that can make a million, seven, seven figures, uh, Brianna Stewart can make seven figures, they're, they're going to play that thing year round no matter what it does to their bodies. And by the time they, they get to the WNBA, you know, they're, they're on weary legs because they've done it year round. And, I, you know, and those are just two of the players, but they've done it from a USA basketball um, level as well. So they're – they're 365 days a year. Um, well, I just think you just need to pour in uh, to women's basketball. Open the books. I see where we can make it. I see where – I don't think we've opened the books um, on a WNBA level or the NCAA level. So we don't – you know, it costs a lot to put our championships on, but we don't know how much. We don't know how much. We got television deals. You know, we know how much they're worth. We we don't know how much is actually being spent on on women's basketball. So on, until we're able to open those books and see where we are failing and where we are in the you know in the black, we we will never know. But obviously, it takes a lot of nurturing. If you know the the NCAA tor men's tournament, you know, fifty years ago, it wasn't making billions. So so what did we do? to build their game up. It's probably very similar to what you need to do if you want to build our, our NCAA tournament up and vice versa with, with the NBA. You know, 50, 60, 70 years ago, they weren't making what they're making now. Something happened. Something happened. Somebody poured into that league and poured into the players, and that's just not taking place on the women's side yet. So, Coach, I, I want to quickly ask you, because this makes me think about the comments that Draymond Green said last week when he basically said that he was really tired of seeing women <laughs> complain about the lack of pay, but he said they're not laying out the steps that can be made to change that. What's your What was your reaction to that, and what's your response to him? Well, I'm, I think Draymond is, is a part of the problem. You know, his line of thinking – um, keeps the status quo. Um, it's systemic. When when it's all said and done, um, let when when it was found out that um, there there wasn't a weight room and and uh, AD just you know enlightened us. Um, there was wasn't supposed to be a weight room until the Sweet Sixteen. I I guess that's what the what our leaders um, agreed on. But when the players get a hold of it and they start um, comparing and putting it on social media, you know, it's going to drum up a lot of, um, it's going to drum up a lot of, stir up a lot of uh, a trouble for um, the overarching um, comparisons. Uh, when when we saw the swag bags and, and, and the difference in what the men and women were getting, you know, it, it, you know, it's just it's a firestorm. Um, but I did, I I, I sent out a a statement just saying it really isn't about a weight room or a swag bag. It's much bigger than that. And, um, you know, it, it's easy for someone to just comment on what they think we should be doing. But when the coaches got together and we saw the disparities, um, we start talking and complaining. You have to talk and complain. Once that happens, you know, we had a Zoom with, with Mark Ember and, and, and we had a Zoom with them. Um, 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 Dan Gabbitt. That's when the that's when things will move. I know for certain because of these conversations that we've had. Um, women's basketball is going to be in a lot better place um, than we were this year uh, compared to where we're going to be next year. So we, you know, money talks. When you make a lot of money, 
when you make a lot of money and you give your opinion on what you think we should be doing, besides giving your, you know, open up your wallet, you know, that's just mere talk. That's mere talk. I mean, Draymond spoke out against it. He spoke out against it. He spoke out for it. Where is, where is he laying it out at? If you're going to speak about it, what do you think? What's your opinion on it besides saying what we're not doing? Hey, Coach, I want to go back to something you said earlier. You know, let, let's talk about coaching and let's talk about coaching the women's game. There's still far too many men head coaching, head coaches, men in, in the game. And so how do we start developing more women to be able to be head coaches? And the other thing is, if we look at this, I mean, why isn't there more women or why isn't there any women coaching in the men's game? Because I've seen the skills level of, that you and some of your counterparts have had and that you definitely could do that. I'm not asking you to do that, but I mean, the question is, why, why don't we see more of that? Well, I, I, you, if you look at, I mean, you, you've been in the rooms with ADs. You know what they look like. You know what, you, what the room looks like. Um, and I'm not saying that is wrong for, for people to be attracted to who they're attracted to. Um, obviously, I've been coaching for 21 years now. I, I know who I like. I know, I mean, I do my research as well. But at the end of the day, I'm going to hire the best person for the job. Um, with ADs, the best person for the job doesn't run in their circle as far as if they're if they're women, um, if they're black women, um, if they're black men. So they're going to hire who's in their circle, or they're going to ask who's in their circle, who's the best out there. And a lot of times it's men that run in men's circles. Um, why aren't there more women on the men's side? Um, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it, it's probably the same things. You'll, you'll, you'll have a sprinkle of coaches who will be like Popovich who will, that will give a woman an opportunity. And then she does her thing and, and it opens up doors for everybody else. I'm going to speak personally for me. My my passion is for 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 women, young women. Um, I, I feel like I have a, a a debt to our game to grow it from from this level. So once they get to the next level, they'll be able to uh, take care of it, so to speak. Um, understand that they're how to take care of it. Understand how to keep their bodies what they need to do in the communities to grow the game, um, how they need to be prepared and be in condition um, to, to grow our game. Um, I, I don't think there's a, a whole lot. I think basketball is, and sports in general, you, you learn when you put in a situation, you know, you adapt. Is it the, you know, is men's basketball so far off from what we're doing in the women's game? I, I don't think so. But once you're in it, and you're seeing it and you're studying it, anybody can make, you know, can adapt to their surroundings. It's just um, this, this, the mountain is too high to climb when you're in the men's game. And there's a lot of pressure on you to, because you're, you're one of very few to do it and do it well. And I don't know if women are willing to put themselves in that situation. Um, or I just feel like women want to coach um, people that look like us um, because for so long that we've, you know, we, we've haven't been given, you know, uh, the greatest opportunity or equitable opportunities that our counterparts have. Well, Dawn, let, let me follow up and ask this. It seems like you have sort of taken up this, uh, you've been sort of a, you, you've been very vocal about the plight of black coaches, but the plight of uh, black women coaches, you know, and I was telling a friend of mine, you know, I think the torch has been passed, you know, John Thompson, John Chaney, Vivian Stringer, and that generation, they were very vocal about the plight of black coaches and black athletes. But it seems like you have taken that mantle on. And I'm just trying to think of, you know, men's coaches on the basketball side. So I think Kevin Ollie was the last person to win, the, black, the last black coach to win a championship, and he got run out of UConn a, a year later. So how do you feel? Do you feel like this is, this is, it is sort of your responsibility uh, to kind of speak up on behalf of uh, African-American coaches? Um, I, I don't know um, if it's my responsibility. I, I do it out of necessity. Um, and that's where my heart is right now because I see so much 
you know, so much around me. And I, I, I'm probably one just over my career and I, just my personality. I, I like to stay in my own lane. I like, you know, I like to just keep it as simple um, and as smooth as possible. Um, I don't like to ruffle feathers. I don't like to be confrontational. I can be, um, but I don't, I don't like to be, but I just feel like there's been a whole lot of um, injustices socially, you know, athletically, um, institutionally that I feel like I, I can't, you know, I am my mother's child. Um, and my mother got ran out of this state of South Carolina where I am, where I coach um, because of something she said to a butcher. Um, hmm. And, and I, I, it's the weirdest thing that as you grow up, you become more like your mom or your dad. And it's something that is something that growing up, I, 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 I never wanted to be like my mom because she was disciplined. She was, um, she, she made you do things her way. But now I'm at that place where I understand now what she was doing. Um, and I'm thankful and grateful that I grew up in a household where my mom didn't spare the ride. Um, I'm <laughs> able to teach. I'm able to mentor. I'm able to do the thing, help our young ladies navigate through life. Um, as a black woman, because it's a little bit different. And it's the same way with our young coaches, because we don't get as many opportunities. So when you do get the opportunities and we're getting them now, if you look and see on both sides, men, men and women, we are getting these jobs that are out here um, and they're good opportunities. We make them great with, with how, how successful we're going to be with it. So it is my job to make sure when, they get these opportunities that we're ready. Awesome. Yes, thank you. So is it, Coach, is it because your mom didn't spare the ride while you were able to have that praise break when you were talking to LaChina Robinson? <laughs> I mean, I mean, my, I mean my, my sister was diagnosed with leukemia in May. And it's, it's nothing but the grace of God that got her through. And, it, it, and we were in a pandemic, so I had that space to help her. You know, I, I cast a wide net. I called every doctor that I could call from MD Anderson to Duke to North Carolina, everywhere. And and I advocated for her. I, we wanted the very best. And a lot of times you, you, you find that all of these doctors know each other. All of these top doctors, they know. So I was name dropping and I was really very much out of my comfort zone. But I mean, this is a life. This is a life. This is a time when, you know, you, you you utilize all the people that you know to find the best care for your sister. But I, you know, I am a faithful praying woman. Um, and, 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 and I, again, thank my mom for keeping us in the church. A lot of times I was going to church because, you know, each Sunday you can you can get my mom for a lot of money. Like you just ask her doing services. <laughs> and I need some money. But, but therein lie lessons life lessons that I've carried on in, in adulthood, which, you know, will, will take me on to when I'm six feet and under, you know, I, I've had a prayer mother and she passed that along as well. Amen. Coach, I want to commend you for one for after the game and how you were with your team, but also how you went over and acknowledged the fans and how you accepted um, that particular defeat because it was questionable. But one thing I want to go into you now, <clears throat> coming from North Philly, going to Charlottesville, Virginia, being a two-time uh, Olympian, going and coaching at Temple, and then going to South Carolina, going from the north to the south and back again and all those other experiences. Talk to us about that. Um, you know, I've, I've been very fortunate in that everything that I've needed to know in my life um, I've had experiences prior to having gone through them. Um, what made me go to Virginia um, from North Philly? Um, I mean, it. I mean, Debbie Ryan did a great job recruiting me from very early on, eighth grade. You know, she was she hung in there, very loyal. North Philadelphians, we're we're loyal, we're loyal. Um, but. Little did I know that experience going to Virginia, predominantly white institution, um, little did I know that later on in my life, 
when it was time to go to get in this coaching. I coached eight years at Temple University, which helped me just hone my skill as a coach. And then taking a job at, at South Carolina, going to a predominantly um, white institution and being one of two black head coaches, one, you know, female black head coach. Um, and sometimes you have blinders on because you, you just want to win. You know, I, I can't, I got into coaching because winning feels good. Being a me, uh, being a dream merchant for young people feels great. But, but little did I know that it, it will come to this, you know, we've had, you know, issues with social justice and I'm right in the thick of, you know, being in a red state. Um, I've been accused of a lot of things when it comes to um, <laughs> politics. Um, but Virginia prepared me for that. Um, it thickened my skin. It gave me what I need to, to combat it, you know, and I do it just by being who I am. I'm not sacrificing anything. Everything that I do, I do from my heart. And I feel like it's, it's for the greater good of not just, not just, you know, our, our followers, but just, you know, human life. Like some things are just really simple. I, it, it takes effort to be a racist, like hmm. incredible hmm. effort to, to not love someone because of the color of their skin is, is mind boggling to me to, you know, and, and I, and I say this and we, we, we have been, we have been, um, supported like no other, like the people that come to our games, there are 12,000 people easily, easily to come to our game. Um, our, our, our players decided to sit. Most of them sat for the national anthem, peaceful protest. Uh, one of them stood because they got military families. One of our other, um, one of my other players decided sitting wasn't a strong enough statement, so she kneeled. And it was it was one of our white players decided to kneel um, after a few games, and she she texts me and she's like, I, "I feel like this isn't enough for who I represent, who I want to represent." I got to kneel. So I'm just like, damn. I'm like, okay, well, I said, they're going to tear, they tear her butt up. So once she did it, I was like, I can't let her go there by herself. So the first time she did it, I, I kneeled with her um, because I didn't want her to come under everything that our players had come under for sitting. Um, so I did it with her. And then, you know, no one really said anything. So I was like, okay, she's cool. So I'm going to let her do that. But then I, I started getting emails about just our players peacefully protesting. And I got one, you know, from, from a fan who actually had my phone number, a donor. And he talked, he, he, he mentioned how disgusting of an act of what our players were doing during the national anthem. And this was, this was January the 5th. Y'all know what happened January the 6th, right? Right, yes. Yeah, yeah. So I waited and responded after I saw exactly what was happening, well, you know, at our state capitol. And I, I sent him back, you know, you know, a note just stating, you know, what did he think about what, what took place? Because he said he was a veteran and this is what he fought for. And he's, you know, a white man that, you know, really can't understand. And how can you, you know, do the how can you allow your players to do these disgusting acts, um, they need to get up because the people there, they're really trying to reach, they're turning off. And then I, you know, I pose that question. So what do you think about what just took place um, at the state capitol? This man, y'all, this man said, everybody has room to improve. <laughs> It's laughable. Like you didn't condemn, you didn't use the adjective you use for our players peacefully doing something. And I don't know what the percentage of veterans out there, but there was a, it was a pretty good percentage of veterans out there, you know, killing the Capitol police officers and all of that. And the only thing that you had to say, everybody has room to improve. Now I will say this, he followed up after our season, like, you know, right after our season. And I have yet, he followed up and just said, you know, he's heartbroken over our loss and the way we lost and he represented 
Um, but I also want to add, I hope our players stand up for the national anthem next year. <laughs> so I haven't, you know, I, again, I'm non-confrontational, but he's going to get a response. It's, it's just I haven't mustered up. Um, I haven't mustered up what, what I want to say to him, but the audacity, the gall, but it, it's not going to be nice. And I, it's probably not going to respond to me ever again, but he has to understand, like no one's asked why. Why are players sitting? So, coach, are you gonna, uh, coach, are you gonna ask him what's he in DC on January sixth? I mean, I mean, I know he wasn't, but I know he didn't condemn it. And there's hmm. something really wrong with that picture. Again, life is so simple. We we complicate things when we yes. really, you know, if we just take things at face value and and for who. Who people? I know people don't agree with our players. I know they don't. Um, but they're they're eighteen to twenty two years old. They're in the most formative years of their lives. If not now, then when? Hey, and coach, let me follow. Let me follow up with this. Let me follow up this, coach. You know, it may be a southern thing too, because the folks of Texas have blamed me for a lot of stuff too. So we got we got that in common. So, coach, let, let me ask you this. And and some of the brothers may get upset at me. When I look around the landscape of Black America in terms of social justice, whether it's sisters in the corporate space, sisters in college athletics, um, sisters you know, working in school systems, principals, superintendents, I really see sisters really pushing the agenda. And I've been a professor 24 years, um, um, uh, uh, coach, and it's always the brothers who tell me, man, calm it down a little bit. It don't take all that. You know, you're a little too radical. And I remember when I was teaching at LSU, coach, I had one day about 15 black students in my office and a brother comes by and he says, Dr. Moore, if I were you, I wouldn't have all these black students in my office at one time. I'm like, why not? Then he said, you don't want all those athletes in your class. I'm like, why not? So here's my here's my theory. Here's my theory, coach. I think sisters understand that they will never be a part of the good old boys club. I think they know that. But I think sometimes it's us brothers. I think we believe if I work hard enough, if I become racially ambiguous, if I don't talk about race, then maybe I could get in the club. What, what do you think about that? And I just thought about that yesterday. What do you think about that, that idea that sisters are driving the agenda because they understand they will never get be a part of that club? You know, I, I think we were built for this. Um, our, our skin is tough. Um, we, we have a way about us that we, we don't back down when we know we're right or not even that we're right personally, but it's right. The way that we see the world, the way, and, and we have this, we have this, we, we really think it can happen. Like we really think we can help people understand how the world should be ran and how you should treat a person no matter what. And we've, that is the thing that, that's so appetizing to us that we want to keep feeding people that because it's so simple. It is so simple. Like I, I feel like, you know, I, I mean, we, we have, a, we call them the WOC, the women of color. We have a, a long list of coaches, head coaches, assistant coaches. We get together and we talk about how we, how we, how we're going to move, like how we're going to up this. And I'm going to give you an example, like in the SEC, we have, we had seven black head coaches out of 14, 14, like we're half, we're half. We might get, we might have eight because Vandy just opened up and they might hire, you know, a black coach and it will be eight. Um, we can write our own narrative. Like we wow. seriously can write our own narrative. If we want one of us to be the, uh, the coach of the year, hey, hey we, we got all the votes. If we deserve it and we don't usually get it, we got all the votes. If we if we think that somebody should be our player of the year, we got the votes. And and it's it's not to say that we're we're you know we're we're gonna do something that is ill-advised or just untrue or should not happen, but we're in a position where we can write our own narrative. What an incredible empowering position. 
Um, yes. And that's just, you know, postseason awards. But we're in a position where we're, our voices are going to be heard. And if there's a vote, then we can we can swing it to the way we want to swing it and have, you know, and have some some black excellence all over our league. You know, something that is not being done anywhere else across the country. And it's it's a it's a great feeling. It's a tremendous feeling that that our voices are going to be heard and we're not we're unafraid to speak up. So it's pretty darn cool. Awesome. Well, Coach, we thank you for uh, taking the time to to join That's us it. today. I'm done. Greatly appreciate it. No, I no, no. I got well, I, I got one more thing. I got one more thing to ask Don, and and this is so your opportunity to work with Coach Cheney, and I had the pleasure of being with him on several different occasions. In fact, I interviewed the AD job at Temple, and they told me that. You said, no, you can't hire that guy. But I had lunch with Coach Cheney. But can you share a couple stories with us about your relationship with Coach? Um, you know, Coach Cheney, up until his death, he, he he would call me probably twice, twice, three times, maybe four times a season. And he would always just keep it simple. Make sure when we had Asia Wilson, she was like, you got bigs? You know, keep working their footwork. Make sure her ass is underneath her at all times. <laughs> um, and he was the best. Like, he was the best um, male coach when I got into coaching that you could ever have. Because, you know, s some male coaches don't really care about women's basketball. And they just really think they can do whatever they want to, you know, to uh, women's basketball coach. But Coach Cheney didn't care. It, the, the, the innocence of him, the purity of him loving a game, he could walk, you know, they practice early in the morning. So he would still be in the office by the time we practice in the afternoon. He would walk through the gym. If he saw us working on a press breaker, he would come on the court, stop everything, and we would go for about an hour and a half. He put in a press breaker that we use utilize today. He was like, here, we're going to put your point guard in the worst possible position on the floor. He's deep in the corner. He was like, and if she can get that ball out, you're going to, you're going to create numbers on the other end. So go score. And he was that way. He was, he kept it, you know, the, the turnovers value, the ball value each possession. He would, he, he actually gave me his, his basketball philosophy on paper. Like I have it. Like he gave it to me three years ago when I went up after we won a national championship, he, he, he had it in a folder. He gave it to me. He's like, I want you to have this. And, is something that I cherish. But every time that he called me, every single time, if I was in my office, I would bring our coaches. I would tell them to come in the office, get your notepads, and let's hear him out because he's going to talk. He's going to give us some nuggets and some lessons that will carry us through uh, for as long as we want to coach. And I'm, I'm, I absolutely adored him. I absolutely adored Coach Cheney because – um, he loved like no other. Yes. Well, Coach, we greatly appreciate all this insight, all the gems you dropped on us, and the story that you just shared as well. I wish we had so much more time to continue the conversation with you. We're going to have to get you back on the show. Thank you. Please. <laughs> hey, yes, Don, thank, thank you. you. Really please. appreciate you. You're the best. You. You're the best. Yes. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Again, that was Don Staley, the women's head coach for South Carolina. Greatly appreciate her uh, dropping those gems, man. She she gave us a lot of information here. But because uh, we're slowly winding down here on time on our first show, before we go, we have to get your final thoughts, right? She talked about uh, laying out, um, or well, rather her response to Draymond Green when he said lay out you know, the steps basically. And she, she talked about pouring into the women's game, pouring into women's sports, pouring into women's basketball. What's your final thoughts doc um, from the conversation that we had with Don and about what's next when it pertains to the women's game? I'll say this. And, 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 you know, the one thing I like about Don and she was talking about just being your authentic self, you know, not necessarily about being confrontational, but it's about doing what's right. And, you know, and I want to talk to a lot of the young people out there today you know, maybe hitting the job market, you know, and I just want to tell you, you know, it's not about how much money your first job, not about how much money you're paying 
not the name on your business card. You want to go work at a place where you can be your authentic self. And, and that's and that's real. You know, this days of wearing the mask, being, you know, this imposter syndrome, all that kind of stuff. Understand you are brilliant, you are talented, you are loved, and God has created you for this moment. So my challenge for you is y'all go out there and kill it. And don't ever think other people are better than you. God has put it in you everything you need to be successful. So we go, we go walk with our head up and we're gonna we're gonna do like Dawn said, you know, we're gonna be our, our authentic self. A D. Uh, you know, um, I'm gonna parallel to what Leonard just said, but take it a step further. Um, Don is not a coach. Uh, she's a minister. Um, what she's doing now is, I mean, it goes back to what John said. Um, she is that good shepherd and she's managing the flock. And the thing that she does uh, so tremendously well is that she doesn't let the thieves or the sheep get in with, I mean, she doesn't let the wolves get in with the sheep. And so um, her voice is always being heard, not only with her students and student athletes, but her, her ministry is so great that all people can relate to her. You don't have to be a sports fan. You could see, as Leonard said, and as she said, she's authentic, she's real, but she's got a blessing and she's been called to do something that many people couldn't do it the way she does it. And, you know, um, I, I'm just uh, elated that I've been able to be in her presence and that I get to continue to see what she does with these young people and what she does for intercollegiate athletics, but better yet, what she does for our country. And from her words, she printed uh, out, rather she released an article with USA Today where it says, don't look away. Now is the time to grow our game. You can help. And so I just mimic her words. Don't look away. We saw what strong women look like. We saw what great basketball looks like. We saw the intensity. We saw people actually have a chance to see what Dawn and so many others have been saying all these years. So now we just ask that you don't look away. And again, we greatly appreciate Dawn Staley for joining us. And we appreciate you for taking the time to watch our very first episode of fourth and just us we will be back here every wednesday live eight o'clock p.m eastern time on facebook as well as youtube so if you haven't already make sure you like subscribe and comment because we want to continue the conversations um as we continue to go forth so doc ad i think we can say we officially wrap this one it's been great guys been great we did it one thing i'd like to share with everybody we're at the end of this pandemic and we could see the light. But one thing we have to do now is we have to be respective of the 500,000 plus people who have passed away. So what we need to do is we all need to go get vaccinated and we need to put our mask on. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> Thanks so much, Kevin. And thank you all for joining us. We'll see you back again next week. Same day, same time. <laughs>